Hello, my beautiful watchers. Now, you can obviously see that I have been forced to forsake my beloved green screen for the more traditional booktuber bookshelf setup. Uh, this is because I am back in the UK for a bit, reconnecting with my family after over a year of pandemic enforced exile in the colonies. I was originally hoping to have this review done and published during Pride Month, but prepping for this trip and the 50,000 mandatory COVID tests I had to arrange really took it out of me, so I've missed yet another deadline. But hey, there's never a bad time to spotlight LGBT authors. The Lights of Prague is an urban fantasy story set in the city of Prague in 1868. It's the first published novel of Nicole Jarvis, a New York-based author and self-professed lover of fanfiction, though thankfully this story doesn't bear any of the telltale signs of a filing off the serial numbers book. It's an original work that started life as a NaNoWriMo project that she later expanded upon. There are two protagonist POV characters. The first is Domek Miska. He works as a lamplighter, which is a real-life historical profession in the days before one widespread electricity that involved traversing a long route of gas-powered street lamps and manually lighting each one every night. However, there's a secondary and much more important part of his profession. In between lighting lamps, he stops to fight horrible and deadly monsters that prowl the streets of Prague at night, feeding on the innocent. His most common adversary appears to be the Piavitsa, which is the Czech word for leech, but uh... Yeah, call them what you want, they're definitely vampires. Other notable nasties include ghosts of various types and some really nasty river-dwelling wankers called the Vodnik that have the poor form to not only kill you, but also trap your soul in a jar afterwards. The naming conventions in these books kind of remind me of the TV show Grimm, which I maintain is highly underrated. I mean, the first few seasons anyway, if you like intentional slock. The other main character is a wealthy, multi-century old Piavitsa called Aura. She embodies the classic, the one good vampire trope, though refreshingly, she doesn't spend most of her time brooding or obsessing about killing every other monster in the world. For the most part, she appears to be just trying to live her best unlife, attending fancy parties and junk. She's as openly bisexual as one could be in that time period. It's not a huge part of the story or her greatest defining character trait, but neither is it insignificant or vague enough to be in danger of coming off as queer a surprisingly rare balance that I suspect Jarvis managed to achieve due to her experience of being an openly bi woman herself. Despite horror elements and a decidedly gothy aesthetic, it's clearly not intended to be a scary book. There's plenty of violence, and Jarvis was able to write tension into scenes in a way you almost never see from a first-time author, but nothing that I found particularly gratuitous, so I would deem it safe even for a faint of heart reader like myself. I'll give you a vague description of the story. Both Domek and Aura independently end up trying to unravel the mystery behind a group of Piavitsa that have somehow overcome what should be deadly weaknesses to wooden stakes and daylight, eventually drawing them together and into bed in the process. Domek also encounters a Will of the Wisp, a tiny entity seemingly made of fire and possessing incredible magical power and a bad attitude. The Wisp ends up bound to him like a genie, but the lucky bugger gets infinite wishes. The first thing that really jumps out of you after reading this book is how surprisingly complex and real the 1860s depiction of Prague feels. Sans the ghosty goos and bloodsuckers, of course. By real, I don't necessarily mean in a geographic or historically accurate way. It might be those things, I just have no way of personally judging, not having been to the Czech Republic or being particularly knowledgeable of the history of that part of the world. What I mean is Jarvis is a very adept world builder and included enough cool little things that gave off the impression of being historically accurate, so the average reader like me is left with a distinct feeling of authenticity. She's also very good at writing very vivid, detailed visual pictures of people environments, and scary-ass monsters, which contributes no end to the reading experience. Alas, this is offset somewhat by the blandness of the main characters. Aura has a marginally more interesting backstory, but a relatively dull plot in the story itself, while Domek is basically a plank of wood whose entire deal boils down to a monster killed his girlfriend, so now he slays them, but he gets a more engaging plotline in the book. Their romance was also a tad underwhelming. I know saying a couple lacked chemistry is usually something used to describe actors, but Somehow that sort of lacklustre lust was achieved here in written form. It certainly doesn't help that their plots don't actually converge all that often when you stop and think about it, even after they bump uglies. They run into each other a few times, share one interesting chapter together, then team up for the climax, but otherwise they're both just 
kind of off doing their own shit. Honestly, the relationships they have with literally everyone else is way more interesting than the one they have with each other. In particular, Domek's relationship with his mother, who's emotionally recovering from the abuse that she suffered from his father before he died, and Aura's extremely sexually charged antagonism with an ex-girlfriend and fellow bloodsucker. There's also a very strong, mostly positive, but flawed relationship explored between Aura and her aging human sister-in-law. You don't often see a lot of books that emphasize that particular connection, let alone supernatural ones. Best of all, though, is the slow buildup of mutual respect between Domek and his Wisp. I kid you not, it actually plays out kind of like a buddy cop movie. I would never have predicted that Will of the Wisp vs. Monster Hunter debates on the subject of morality would be a strong draw for a book, but props to her for making it work. Why are you so determined to work against me? Domek asked. You're malicious, but you don't seem evil. You could have killed me in that alley. The more I think about it, the more I think you're just trying to scare me into freeing you. Why go through all the trouble when you could just work with me? You? The man who controls my spirit against my will? I have no reason to trust you. Most men are selfish, disgusting creatures. When they're suddenly given the power to change the world, nearly all of them immediately use it for self-gain, no matter the cost. Not all men, though, Domek said. But you're the same. The moment you ran into trouble, you called me forward to win your battles. I told you that was a test, Domek pointed out. Are you saying that if you ran into trouble again, that you wouldn't summon me immediately? You would die before calling me to aid you? Fine, you're right. Of course you're right. When it comes to life or death, I'll use whatever resources I have. Even if that resource is a slave you got by killing someone else, the Wisp said. You're not a... Domek cut himself off mid-sentence. What can I say? The Wisp has a point. Even with an eventual promise of freedom being granted after the quest's completion, for now it is a sapient being, and Domek is intentionally keeping it bonded in servitude to him. That will always be wrong on a deep fundamental level. Aladdin was a slave owner for like 99% of that movie. These days you're very unlikely to find a book that involves vampires and a secret society of monster hunters that isn't somewhat riddled with cliches, and alas, this was no exception. Honestly, I am more surprised when a vampire hunter doesn't fall in love with a vampire. However, I don't think Jarvis was trying to reinvent the wheel when it comes to urban fantasy. She took a pretty trope-heavy genre and managed to put some occasional semi-unique spins on things here and there. For example, her visual design for the vampires is somewhat non-traditional. They appear normal until they enter their feeding state, in which their mouths slit open impossibly wide and large, their regular teeth retract, and a second roll of needle fangs slides out instead, so, uh, yeah, less this, more this. Yes. There's also a cool additional piece of lore regarding them. Once someone is turned into a creature of the night, they develop this utterly irresistible compulsion to kill anyone directly related to them. This puts an even stronger emphasis on how cruel it is for them to convert a human, and does a better job than usual at explaining why Aura would let her various romantic partners die of old age. As names for secret organizations dedicated to protecting the world from supernatural entities go, the Lamblighters isn't bad, it's certainly got a ring to it. Back in the negatives though, I started getting certain side characters mixed up towards the end, which was a little awkward when they started getting killed and I wasn't entirely certain if I was supposed to be celebrating or mourning until a protagonist reacted. The problem was, so many of them seemed to speak with the same voice, if you know what I mean. They behaved and spoke in such a similar way, they never felt distinct from one another. It's a shame because Jarvis was able to write quite compelling dialogue overall, it just goes to waste when it comes out to these indistinguishable, forgettable characters. Jarvis paints quite an interesting picture of Prague in decline, but in a way that mostly only bothers the vamps that were around long enough to see it in its glory days, making them come off kind of just like grumpy boomers. I was mildly disappointed that after the big mystery about the super, super powered vampires was so played up, the payoff wasn't all that great in my opinion. It's not quite a wizard did it, but it's pretty close. As a sword enthusiast, I have to admit I was mildly offended by the part of the climax in which two lamplighters face off against each other, and it's stated that the man who's dual-wielding pocket-sized stakes has the advantage over the guy with a frickin' sword just because that was their usual weapon of choice. Sheer poppycock, I say, the massive range difference alone would decide it even without considering cutting edges. So all in all, I think this particular book is... okay. It didn't blow my mind, but it did leave me 100% certain that this author has incredible potential. If she can just get a handle on writing more interesting characters and maybe improving on the pacing a bit, I think the sequels that were set up are going to be awesome.
Thank you for joining me, my beautiful watchers. Before you go, don't forget to do all of those wonderful things that help your favourite YouTubers avoid algorithm obscurity, like subscribing if you're new, commenting if you have thoughts, and liking if you enjoyed it or just really want to poke something. Might as well be the like button. If you feel so inclined, do feel free to check out my Patreon page to see what rewards are available for supporting the show. Please take care of yourselves out there in these troubled times, and I will see you soon. What you gonna do? What you gonna do when the lights on you, lamp boys, lamp boys? What you gonna do? What you gonna do when the lights on you? The monster hunter with an urge to slay his wispy friend, the Atten Sundere. The beasts they fight, the ships they fuel. One so hot, but they're both so cool. Lamp boys, lamp boys, what you gonna do? What you gonna do when the lights on you, lamp boys, lamp boys? What you gonna do? What you gonna do? Much love and appreciation to my patrons of honor, Shelby Holtz, Sattel Spurtloff, and Kat Harker. Shout out to Il Nej for performing this awesome tune, check out his channel for more parody and original songs, and a huge thank you to this video's co-producer, Kate Robinson. She does some really amazing work on her channel that I think you would really enjoy, so be sure to check that out too. Other notable nasties include ghosts of various types and some really nasty riving river. Nasties include ghosts of various types and some really nasty river driving. Some really nasty river drilling wankers that called the bilibilibiba. Some really nasty drilling. Not used to wearing pants while I film.